the North against South, brother against brother. The Civil War is the bloodiest in American history. Victory will take far more than brute firepower on the battlefield. Technology, communications, logistics. It's what happens behind the front line that will ultimately decide this battle for America's future. We are pioneers and trailblazers. We fight for freedom. We transform our dreams into the truth. Our struggles will become a nation. Eighteen sixty two. The Civil War is at its height. North and South locked in a bitter conflict for the future of America. A new kind of bullet has brought this war to a terrible deadlock. Bringing death on a scale never previously seen in warfare. Here at a metalworks in Springfield, Illinois, molten lead is beginning its journey to becoming a lethal instrument of destruction. The bullet known as the mini ball. This crude piece of lead is the primary reason for the unprecedented levels of slaughter in this war. Invented in France, just an ounce in weight and half an inch across, one person can cast 3,000 mini balls an hour. Each one of these simple bullets can rip through a man's body in a fraction of a second. The mini ball is used by North and South alike. Demand for this killer bullet runs so high that an entire industry springs up supplying mini balls to the front line. In total, the North makes over half a billion mini balls, ready to be fired from the two million muskets it supplies to its men. In many ways, the Civil War was the first modern war because it was the first war that took place after the Industrial Revolution had begun to transform our country. It will take over 33 hours for a bullet in this box to travel the 800 plus miles to the battlefield, ready to find its target. The new musket is much faster to reload than traditional weapons. Load the gunpowder, Ram down the bullet. And it's ready to fire. Imagine warfare where your ability to load a musket faster than the guy with the other musket would determine if you lived or died. on the inside of the barrel, rifling, spin the ball toward its target. The improved accuracy and range are a deadly combination. One second, everything's great. The next second, your guys, your, your buddy's head's gone. Or his arm's flying off. You don't want to know what a soft metal musket ball does when it enters the human body.
On impact, the bullet flattens out. Bone shatters and splinters. causing further damage to muscle and tissue. More often than not, the result of a direct hit, death. But for all the mini-ball's technological edge, the army still uses traditional military tactics. What made it particularly tragic was modern technology meeting much more ancient tactics. So uh, the, the death rates were, were truly appalling. The troops still face one another openly in lines across the battlefield. But the mini ball is accurate over a range of 600 yards, easily spanning this distance. and it can be reloaded eight times faster than a traditional weapon. The effects are catastrophic. The kill rate increases dramatically compared to previous wars. Across the battlefield, the results are carnage. Blood and death on a previously unseen scale. They killed each other in droves, in lines and in piles. Soldier Alexander Hunter writes, One lay on his face with his body almost in two parts. Another was shot just as he was taking aim. One eye was still open while the other was closed, and one arm extended in a position of holding his rifle, which lay beside him on the ground. The troops on both sides must live in the middle of this untold death and suffering. Horatio Chapman records the experience in his diary. The dead in some places were piled upon each other, and the groans and moans of the wounded were truly saddening to hear. Some were just alive and gasping, but unconscious. Others were mortally wounded and were conscious of the fact that they could not live long. By the time of the North's final victory, over 600,000 men on both sides are dead. Some 2% of the entire U.S. population. In current population terms, that's the equivalent of 6 million people. Almost half of the dead remain unidentified. The fear of dying forgotten on the battlefield leads soldiers for the first time to begin pinning their names and units on their uniforms. These crude, early versions of the dog tag will make it possible to identify their bodies after they're killed. For the first time, America's growing postal service means soldiers can write to their loved ones from the front. With none of today's military censorship, it allows soldiers like Robert Stiles to relay the terrifying realities of life on the front line. The sights and smells that assailed us were simply indescribable. Corpses swollen to twice their original size. Some of them actually burst asunder with the pressure of foul gases and vapors. Fueling this carnage lies the deep political animosity that has led to this war. In a bitter conflict that has pitted brother against brother, the South is determined to defend its independence and its system of slavery. But the North will not allow it to leave the Union of States. We fought and lost hundreds of thousands of men on both sides, fighting for what they believed was right. 
The unholy alliance of new weapons and outdated battle tactics means a body count on an industrial scale. The war is locked in a bloody stalemate. Neither side can land a decisive blow. In this bitter war of attrition, victory will come to the last man standing. August 1862, over a year into the war. General Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army is readying to launch a wide-ranging assault against Union forces in Virginia. Highly motivated, these men are fighting on their home turf and are ready to die for Southern independence, its traditions, and its rural way of life. Its prosperity is built around a simple crop, cotton. Known as white gold, the South accounts for two-thirds of the world's supply of cotton. It brings extraordinary wealth to the southern states. But it is wealth built on the backs of slaves. Now Lincoln's victory at the ballot box threatens this traditional way of life and the slavery it is built on. Rather than submit to northern rule, the South decides to fight. They want a separate nation. General Robert E. Lee takes command at the head of the newly formed Army of Northern Virginia. Lee, a brilliant graduate of the elite West Point Academy, is already a veteran of the Mexican War. And highly regarded for his effectiveness on the battlefield. Lee could intuit the battlefield uh, in a way that almost resembles Rommel in World War II or uh, Patton. And as a result, he could, he could sort of almost sense where the place would be to take the gamble and where to hit. Manassas, Virginia, 1862. Confederate troops gather ahead of the second battle of Bull Run. Lee's forces are heavily outnumbered. But this Virginia woodland is home territory these volunteer troops know like the back of their hand. Rigid training and strict discipline have turned them into a formidable fighting force. If you'd been a betting man back then, you would have bet the South would have won. The South only had to hold its territory. The North had to come and take it away. The North had to be the occupying force, which is far harder to do. At Bull Run, Lee easily demonstrates his force's superiority. In one engagement lasting just 10 minutes, the Yankee 5th New York Regiment loses more men than any other regiment during the entire Civil War. All told, Lee's men kill over 1,700 Union soldiers. Ah! Determination and local knowledge give the South their greatest victory in the war to date. But Lee and his commanders have underestimated the nature of this conflict and of their opponent, President Abraham Lincoln. Because Lincoln is fighting a totally new kind of war. And his southern adversaries just don't get it. A packed train speeds on its way south, ready to replenish the Union Army with fresh troops and supplies. Lieutenant George Benedict writes home. 
we were stowed away in freight cars and started out of the city. The train took 600 other troops besides our regiment and numbered 34 heavily loaded cars. The railroad, one of Lincoln's hidden weapons in this war. In one key operation ordered directly by the president, 25,000 fresh troops are sent on a 1,200-mile journey to the south. By road, it would take over two months. By rail, it will take these men just seven days. Following its introduction in the 1830s, America's rail infrastructure has gradually spread its tentacles across the country. Lincoln realizes it can revolutionize the speed of troop deployments. He strikes a deal with the rail owners to put the North's railroad network under government control. It turns the railroad into a weapon of war. Instead of armies being limited to the speed at which they could march, all of a sudden you had armies being able to move to, uh, to the front uh, by rail, and more importantly, supplies. Supplies and troops pour out of the north towards the battlefront. Some busy lines carry 800 tons of supplies a day, the equivalent of 80 railroad cars. In Lincoln's hands, the 24,000 miles of rail track in the north becomes an arm of his war machine. But the south has a far smaller network, just 9,000 miles at the start of the war, and it remains under private control. In the four years the war lasts, the North adds 4,000 miles of new track to its network, against just 400 miles in the South. This inability to coordinate rail supplies will prove disastrous for the South. Even though they're just 30 miles from their capital in Richmond, in the winter of 1863, four rail links mean Southern troops in Virginia starve. For all their brilliance and determination in battle, the South simply lacked the logistics to deliver a decisive blow. And it isn't simply rail. Lincoln realizes that victory depends on mobilizing the entire industrial might of the North behind the war effort. Production of clothing in the North doubles during the conflict. Pitchfork manufacturers start making swords, while the number of patents doubles in the course of the war. Manufacturing, technology, infrastructure, it will change the face of America. For the first time in history, industry is put behind the war effort. An approach to conflict that America will exploit in the First and Second World Wars. It is the beginning of a new, integrated economy that will be the hallmark of the modern age. In a building just across the road from the White House is a small room that will become Lincoln's nerve center in this war. And at its heart, a simple device that will transform how this war is fought and won. The Telegraph. The invention of Morse code in 1844 turns the telegraph into America's first tool of mass communication.
quickly encoded the basic system of dots and dashes sealed for brief messages. Like Twitter today, it needs just seconds to send them and transcribe them. Where messengers previously took days, on horseback, over hundreds of miles, and across every kind of terrain. Now, the country's 50,000-mile telegraph network means communication is almost instantaneous. As telegraph poles snake out alongside the railroad lines, this vast country begins to shrink. It will transform the nature of this war, as information and decisions can flow backwards and forwards at lightning speed. It became kind of the early version of email. Suddenly it was possible to get a message to somebody from St. Louis, you know, to get a message to New York in a shockingly short amount of time. Lincoln immediately realizes the telegraph's potential as a weapon of war. He insists on the installation of telegraph lines directly into the War Department. And he quickly acts to place all telegraph facilities in the Union under military control. The telegraph office becomes the central hub of Lincoln's war operation, his command and control center. He even takes to sleeping here at busy times. The telegraph office manager, David Homer Bates, describes how Lincoln obsesses over every scrap of news from the front, sometimes reading dispatches word by word as they are deciphered. Lincoln's habit was to go immediately to the drawer each time he came into our room and read over the telegrams, beginning at the top until he came to the one he had seen on his previous visit. The North's telegraph network spreads its tentacles far and wide, sucking information back to Lincoln and his commanders in Washington. It gives him a vast strategic overview, providing him an unrivaled insight into his commander's tactical thinking. Lincoln himself was able to stay on top of literally hour-by-hour hour developments in, in the course of individual battles. That had never happened before. To the irritation of his generals, it even allows him to issue his own direct orders, telling them how to fight. In one campaign, with General Lee's forces threatening Washington, Lincoln responds by telegraphing direct orders to his generals. The exposed position of General Banks makes his immediate relief a point of paramount importance. You are therefore directed by the President to move against Jackson at Harrisonburg. This movement must be made immediately. In the course of the war, Lincoln sends almost a thousand telegrams from this small office. But the South never grasped the potential of the telegraph in creating a centralized command and control system. It means Southern generals like Lee must plan their battles without that kind of strategic overview. As the war continues, Lincoln brings down the hammer of his war machine. Industry, lines of communication and supplies, manpower and firepower are all marshaled to deliver blow after blow to the Confederate Army. But the South 
bolstered by the belief in the rightness of its cause, doggedly refuses to give in. As a result, the death toll just keeps rising. At Antietam in 1862, 6,000 are killed. 17,000 wounded. Over four times as many as during World War II's D-Day landings. The carnage will trigger a revolution in battlefield medicine. Three quarters of all operations conducted by army surgeons during the Civil War are amputations. Letters from surgeon William Watson record what these battlefield ERs were like. Day before yesterday, I performed 14 amputations without leaving the table. I do not exaggerate when I say I have performed, at the least calculation, 50 amputations. There are so many severely wounded through the joints. There are so many operations yet to be performed. Surgeon Theodore Diamond describes the hideous wounds left by weapons like the mini ball. The shattering, splintering, and splitting of a long bone by the impact of the mini ball is both remarkable and frightening. An experienced surgeon can hack off a limb in just 10 minutes. Ether and chloroform are used as anesthetics. If a bullet doesn't kill you, an infection can. Gangrene is the greatest killer. Deprived of oxygen, wounds become an ideal breeding ground for Clostridium, a bacteria that releases a poisonous toxin, destroying tissue. Death can follow quickly. Approximately 60,000 amputations are performed during the Civil War, more than in any other war America has fought in. Twice as many soldiers die from infected wounds and disease as on the battlefield. This unprecedented carnage forces a complete rethink of traditional battlefield medicine. Looking after the well-being of soldiers becomes as central to the war effort as the supply of guns and ammunition. Large numbers of women sign up as battlefield nurses. One of them is Clara Barton. Morning, Clara Barton is untrained and unpaid. When she starts, most nurses are men. It is a menial occupation. The remedies she proposes for the care of the wounded are simple, but revolutionary in their effect. They want food, clothing, shelter, medicines, and a few calm, practical persons to administer them. She insists the injured have a ready supply of clean bandages. First aid, the sorting of the wounded to put the most serious cases first. The Civil War brings in a series of innovations that form the basis of battlefield medicine to this day. 20,000 women sign on as nurses during the war. Clara Barton herself goes on to found the American Red Cross. Standards of hygiene begin to dramatically improve with the discovery of bromine. This caustic chemical is effective against the bacteria that cause gangrene. As a result, nearly three quarters of amputees survive surgery, and gangrene becomes rare by the war's end. With the war dragging on without a clear end in sight, Lincoln is increasingly forced to fight on a very different front. 
the war for public opinion. The spread of portable cameras means for the first time, gory images of the battlefield can now reach every home. While these simple cameras rule out dramatic action scenes, they are ideal for capturing the gruesome aftermath of battle. As many as 1,500 photographers flood the battlefield. Their images are sold widely to members of the public for as little as 25 cents. It was war photography coming back from the Civil War that captured it in a way, made it real, and made people recognize the, the really extraordinary, unprecedented violence. America's growing newspaper mass media reproduces simple woodcuts of the images. More than 200 correspondents cover the war, filing over 100 million words of copy. This deluge of information about the war ensures the grim reality of this conflict is seared into the public consciousness. Never again will politicians be able to fight wars without public support. The war means a soldier is five times more likely to die than a civilian. Where families used to grieve for the dead at home, now men die on the battlefield. It forces a fundamental shift in the rituals surrounding death. Nat Bowditch dies on a battlefield in Virginia. Yet his family in Boston can still say goodbye to their son, killed 500 miles away. Even though it has taken a week for his body to travel from the battlefield, his father describes how it is free of any signs of decomposition. Though the marks of closely contested battle were still upon the face, the features were placid, as if he was sleeping. That's because of the new technique known as embalming. Chemicals like arsenic and zinc chloride are injected into the corpse to halt the natural process of decay. The business of death and the preservation of bodies turns undertakers into overnight millionaires. One undertaker boasts, I would be glad to prepare private soldiers. They were worth a $5 bill apiece. But Lord bless you, a colonel pays 100 and a brigadier general, 200 If you've got the money, all sorts of new techniques are available. Airtight coffins and embalming are most popular. And for the wealthiest, even elaborate refrigerated coffins packed with ice. The war drags on. Lincoln is determined to end it and abolish slavery. In September 1862, he gives the South an ultimatum. Rejoin the Union. He threatens to forcibly liberate their slaves if they refuse. But the South, having tasted independence, does not want to rejoin a union where slavery would be at risk. They reject the ultimatum. Lincoln is in no mood to negotiate. If the South won't free their slaves, he will do it himself. For white Southerners, it was a confirmation that their thoughts about Lincoln all along, that he was, in fact, somebody who was bent on destroying what they thought was the Southern way of life. In the North, in a sense, it gave people a different understanding of what the war was about. On January 1st, 1863, Lincoln issues a proclamation abolishing slavery in the rebellious Southern states. Thanks to the telegraph, the news quickly spreads. On the first day of January, 
in the year of our Lord, 1860. Lincoln had totally grown to where he said that not only should blacks not be slaves, they should be treated as equal citizens with full enfranchisement, right to vote, right to participate. All persons held as slaves shall be then, henceforth, and forever free. In the wake of Lincoln's emancipation of the slaves, black American soldiers rushed to enlist for the Union. Almost 200,000 sign up by the end of the war. General James Blunt describes their skill as fighters. I never saw such fighting as was done by the Negro Regiment. They make better soldiers in every respect than any other troops I have ever had under my command. The Emancipation Proclamation changes the dynamics of the war. The Union Army becomes a force for liberation, now fighting to end slavery. They understood that saving the Union would give them some sense of freedom, some sense of dignity. It was the dignity that I'm a soldier. I'm not just a servant. I'm a soldier. I have a uniform. I have stripes. I'm somebody. Lincoln follows the proclamation with his masterstroke. His address in 1863 dedicating America's first national cemetery for soldiers at Gettysburg is perhaps the single most famous piece of political rhetoric in history. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. It is an emotional thing to think about people sacrificing, giving their lives for an ideal. And it's Lincoln at his absolute best um, the genius, the simplicity that conveys a great amount. It's spiritual in a way. It's a hymn to America, and it's the hymn to the possibilities and the great sacrifices of this country. But in 1864, the war remains deadlocked. With an election looming and a challenge coming from those who want to negotiate a peace with the South, Lincoln knows he needs to land a decisive blow. At some point, somebody gets tired, somebody blinks, somebody makes a mistake. And when you're talking about war, that mistake, that's everything. Lincoln puts the North's entire industrial might behind one final push. The man who will lead the charge from Chattanooga to Atlanta, William Sherman. His orders, to stop for nothing. I would make this war as severe as possible and show no symptoms of tiring till the South begs for mercy. Advancing under the cover of night, Sherman's march is sustained by one of the greatest logistical operations yet seen in this conflict. Sherman knows he needs to throw everything he's got at the Confederate Army. 
while he uses his own supply lines to maximum effect. He destroys those of the South, ripping up their railroad and bending it beyond use. In one day, the North supply lines replace 200,000 bullets. While the South is left scavenging on the battlefield for spent rounds, food, even old boots. Sherman calls it total war a scorched earth approach that becomes the trademark of modern warfare. Finally, with Atlanta under siege, Confederate forces set fire to their own munition stores before abandoning their city to the Union soldiers. Sherman's tactics of total war have won out. His victory helped secure Lincoln's election in the fall. With Atlanta in ruins, he just keeps going, now launching what will be his final assault, the March to the Sea. In the 19th century equivalent of shock and awe, 62,000 Union soldiers wreak a 60-mile-wide path of destruction across Georgia from Atlanta to the coast at Savannah. Supply lines are cut, villages are sacked, and crops torched. Anything of military value is destroyed. Within six months, General Lee has tendered the Confederate Army's surrender. The rebellion is over. The South will have to submit to the Union and bring an end to slavery. By the act of winning, the North both validated freedom and validated the industrial model. And so you have an American confidence, an American sense of achievement, uh, an American willingness to go out around the world. For all the Confederacy's commitment, its inferior logistical infrastructure has been no match for the North's unstoppable war machine. Its industrial heartland, its growing network of railroads, its telegraph network, all bring victory to the North. Within a week, Lincoln lies dead from an assassin's bullet. But America has pulled back from the brink. The nation is once again united. And out of that unity now grows a modern industrialized economy that will reach right across this great continent. The Civil War is over. Survivors head out across the frontier. A vast wilderness separates East and West. Veterans become railway men, cowboys, settlers. Conquering nature, they'll unite the continent. Their mission, to tame the Wild West. Eighteen sixty five, the Great Plains. Where thirty million buffalo roam.
vast, untouched, a wilderness dividing America. Crossing the continent takes six months. 20,000 die on wagon trains. By ship, it's an 18,000-mile journey around South America. To conquer the wilderness and unite East and West, President Lincoln greenlights a transcontinental railroad. 2,000 miles long. It will transform the nation triggering a tidal wave of settlement across the Great Plains. The railroads were vital to the expansion of America. This technology connects people in a way that never before in the history of mankind has there been that kind of connection. America's ancient wilderness meets modern American steel and muscle. An army of hammer-wielding men. Irish immigrants. Civil War vets. Railway men. Their mission, to tame nature itself. The biggest obstacle heading east from California, a 12,000-foot wall of granite. The Sierra Nevada. Where the Pacific and North American plates collide, billions of tons of ancient rock rise up, crumpling like tin foil. Over the last four million years, the Sierra Nevada mountains climb more than two miles high. They're still growing, 13 feet in a thousand years. One day, they could rival the Himalayas. Only a madman would dream of running a railroad across mountains like this. They don't call him Crazy Judah for nothing. Obsessed with the railroad, he sees a way through. Come on down, boys. Theodore Judah makes 23 trips into the peaks. And pick that, boys. Plotting a path across ridges and through mountain summits. Building it will be the engineering challenge of the century. Yeah. Let's mark that. This is the most magnificent project ever conceived. An enterprise more important to the people of the United States than any other. The railroad will be built, and I will have something to do with it. Americans love someone who can go through seemingly difficult or impossible things and make their dreams happen. With Judah's route approved, two companies begin work. The Union Pacific starts from Omaha in the east. The Central Pacific from Sacramento in the west. They'll meet in Utah. It will cost over two billion in modern money. But the government doesn't have enough cash. It pays the companies in federal land. They must finish in 15 years or lose everything. We have learned in this country that you really don't get anywhere in life if you don't take some risks. But I think America is by far the shining light of the world in so many ways because we are risk takers. Paid by the mile, adding curves adds profit. Corrupt investors built the railroad for every cent they can. A nine mile curve means an extra 120 acres of federal land. They'll end up owning an area the size of Texas. First, they must conquer the Donner Pass, 7,500 feet up, the highest on Judah's route. Cursed by 30 feet of snow each winter, avalanches, tragedy. Here, just 20 years earlier, the Donner Party became trapped in the snow and ate each other. Now, Judah's railroad cuts right through the mountain. 1,649 feet of rock must be excavated, the longest tunnel on the route. Chinese laborers dig day and night. It's easier to ship workers from China than get Americans across the continent. The railroad magnates said, the Chinese built the Great Wall, didn't they? Let's bring the Chinese in to do this work. 
Over 10,000 Chinese laborers earn less and do the deadliest jobs. The Transcontinental Railroad was built by Chinese workers brought over specifically to work on the railroad, and they were considered somewhere in between human and animal. They were not expected to survive. They were expected to come here and work and die. 7,000 miles from home, 17-year-old Hung Lei Wu swaps a life of poverty in Canton for the back-breaking work on a railroad gang. Hung Lei Wu must cut through granite so tough, a rock the size of a big toe will support a 50-ton locomotive. Progress slows two inches a day. To break through, they need nitroglycerin. But transporting it is banned when 15 men are blown to pieces. In a mobile lab, Scottish chemist James Houghton mixes it on the spot. Nitroglycerin is 13 times more powerful than gunpowder. So unstable, any physical shock and it will explode in his hands. Howden gets hazard pay. $4,000 a month in modern money. After three months in the mountains, he turns to drink, leaving the nitro to Chinese men like Hung Lei Wo. Irish crews won't touch it. Detonation creates temperatures of 9,000 degrees, as hot as the surface of the sun. So, so. An estimated 1,500 Chinese die in explosions and rock slides. Hung Lei Wo survives. His son will be the first Chinese American to graduate in engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. Once through the mountains, Track laying accelerates from 10 inches to 6 miles a day. Each spike is struck three times. 10 spikes to a rail. 400 rails a mile. 21 million hammer swings complete the railroad. May 10th, 1869. A one-word message arrives by telegraph. Done. A six-month journey across the continent is cut to six days. The folks who had once had to risk everything in a wagon train, that is eliminated. You now can get on the railroad and travel from Boston to Sacramento. That's a revolution. The internet of the era, the transcontinental railroad changes everything it touches, triggering a mass migration to the Great Plains. The Great Plains, conquered by steel and steel. The Transcontinental Railroad threads a thin line of civilization through the wilderness. People follow. In just one year, 40,000 settlers moved to Nebraska, fanning out across the frontier in wagon trains. When in the mid-19th uh, 
century to the late 19th century, they went out and settled some hostile territory known to mankind, the Great Plains where I grew up. These were true pioneers. The government accelerates the process with the greatest land giveaway in history. Anyone with a $10 filing fee can claim free land. A quarter are single women and ex-slaves. When you see the desperate scramble in these rickety wagon trains, you realize that the promise of America was land. These are people who never in a million years would be able to own land in Europe. Eventually, 10% of the United States will be given away under the Homestead Act. I'm not going back to Indiana to rent until I bust entirely and have to walk back. Uriah Oblinger, Civil War vet, claims his 160 acres in Nebraska. There's a catch. 110 degree summers spark prairie fires. Trees can't survive the drought and flames. There's so little rain, nothing grows here but grass. Without lumber to build houses, the new inhabitants live in mud huts, built of sod, cut from the plains. Uriah dismantles his wagon to make doors and windows. They often had insects. They invited snakes. It was, well, pretty much like living in a burrow in the ground. I think the pioneers did have it hard. They conserved, they were frugal. The one dress lasted a long, long time. For Uriah's wife, Maddie, it's a price worth paying. I expect you think we live miserable because we are in a sod house. But I tell you, in solid earnest, I never enjoyed myself better. Every lick we strike is for ourselves and not half for someone else. The devout Oblingers face daily tests of their faith. With no mountains to stop the wind, the Great Plains are a breeding ground for massive thunderstorms. The most objection I have to the weather here is the wind. There's a great deal of it during winter and spring, and being nothing to break it, one feels it more. Don't go too far, honey. The Oblingers live in Tornado Alley. More twisters hit this region than anywhere else on Earth. Over 400 touchdown every year. Tell the folks they never seen a storm in Indiana. Only playthings. 200 mile an hour winds spin into a vortex, sucking in air and anything not bolted down. In 1930, a man is carried a mile across Kansas. Fish and toads rain from the sky. The Oblingers hunker down in their heavy sod house, clinging to their newfound independence. I think that we're a nation of people descended from tough old coots and tough old broads. And, and I say that with great admiration. They just wanted to control their own future and to have children who could control their own destiny. Tornadoes aren't the only biblical challenge the Oblingers face. By a river in the Rockies, the end of the world is brewing. A prehistoric species emerges to battle for the Great Plains. Locusts. After devouring the local vegetation, they release pheromones that signal it's time to move on. They grow long wings. Swarms head east on the wind. They join up over the Great Plains and become a plague. In 1874, they devour half of the crops in the West. Three trillion locusts. Half a mile high, 100 miles wide, 1,000 miles long, as big as Colorado. They block out the sun. 
agricultural Armageddon. To men like Uriah, the locusts are the wrath of God. By 1892, half the population of western Nebraska goes east. Uriah stays. You have to be brave in order to achieve in this country because nothing's set right there for you. You have to take chances. And I think bravery and fear are the same things. It's just a matter of how you react to that same feeling. Those who stick it out get lucky. Within 30 years, the locust is extinct. Its breeding grounds in the Rockies plowed over by settlers like Uriah. In 10 years, the Great Plains become the breadbasket of the country. For the first time, America can feed itself. Today, 50 million tons of wheat is farmed each year. But trees are still scarce, and to build towns, settlers need wood. In Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, loggers harvest over 50 million acres of trees. Green gold. A magnet for Scandinavian woodsmen. Between 1825 and 1925, a third of Norway's entire population comes to America, including Nils Haugen. The pay was $3 a day. You had to have a good pair of driving boots, well caulked, to be able to keep on top of the logs. There's millions of dollars at stake. If the flow of logs stops, towns can't be built. Log jam. River man's ruin. In 1886, pine to build 20,000 homes gets stuck on the St. Croix River. 150 million feet of wood. Remove the right log, and the rest will explode downstream. Rivermen die, clearing obstructions like this. In 1892, two billion feet of lumber will be cut in Wisconsin alone. The railroad feeds lumber into the West's construction boom. Towns are built so fast, there's no time to name streets. They're given letters and numbers. The Great Plains is also home to the most numerous species of large wild mammal on Earth. 30 million buffalo. Herds up to 25 miles long race to summer breeding grounds. On a collision course with the modern world. The railroad brings a new kind of hunter to the Great Plains. Driven by profit. Fresh from the carnage of the Civil War. Two million rifles are in circulation. Over a million veterans trained to use them have a new target in their sights. Frank Mayer, Civil War vet. Buffalo Hunter. I had nothing to look forward to in civilization. I was crazy about guns. Mayer tracks 2,000 pound buffalo. Easily capable of crushing a man. He picks them off from 200 yards. If you could kill them, what they brought was yours. They were walking gold pieces. Hunters harvest the buffalo for its hide. In 1872, they ship over one million out of Kansas alone. 
worth $3 a piece back east. On a good day, Mayer earns more than the president. Factories use long strips of buffalo leather as drive belts. Small pieces become coats and shoes. To meet demand, hunters kill 8,000 buffalo a day for their hides alone. For Americans, this is progress because this is a natural resource. From the Indian perspective, they couldn't understand what the white people were doing. But of course, they knew that the decimation of those buffalo herds would change their lives forever. The Plains Indians depend on the buffalo and worship them. The buffalo were our strength, from whence we came and at whose breast we suck as babies all our lives. Black Elk is six years old when the railroad arrives. Unlike the white hunters, his people waste none of their kill. Sinews become bowstrings. Bones are cups and spoons. Skin is clothing, teepees, and coffins. Native Americans and buffalo have coexisted since the last ice age. Black Elk's ancestors hunted them on foot. There were no horses to ride. The modern horse isn't native to North America. Spanish conquistadors brought them from Europe in 1493. Some escaped to the Great Plains, perfect horse habitat. 400 years later, over a million Mustangs run wild. Taming horses transforms the life of the Plains Indian. They become expert horsemen. The battle cry went up, okay, which means to charge. And the hunters went in for the kill. On horseback, the bow is the weapon of choice. In the time it takes to reload a gun, a warrior can ride 300 yards and fire 20 arrows. Buffalo can run at 35 miles an hour. Hunts cover hundreds of miles over many days. It can take 15 arrows to kill a buffalo. White hunters like Frank Mayer use a single cartridge. He aims for the lungs. A clean kill drops a buffalo without disturbing the herd. Thirty million are killed in little over a decade. After hunters take the hides, trainloads of men arrive to pick their carcasses. They make buttons from bones and grind down skeletons for fertilizer and porcelain. The primary resource keeping Native Americans alive is gone. Facing starvation, they're forced onto reservations. My great-great-grandmother, Grandma Big Eagle, was alive when, when buffalo hunting ended. They weren't just saying goodbye to a kind of a food stuff. They were saying goodbye to a way of being in the world. And I think for them to look back on that um, was just unspeakably sad. In 1889, just 85 wild buffalo exist in the whole United States. The men who ride the great iron horse are taming the wilderness. The railroad will bring another modern American icon to the Great Plains. The last of the great frontiersmen. Eighteen sixty five. 
the Civil War leaves cities on the eastern seaboard stripped of resources. The country's booming population needs food. In Texas, over six million cattle roam wild. Worth four dollars a head here, but back east, they're worth 40. By 1868, the railroad spreads from the east, crossing Kansas, but it hasn't reached Texas. There's still 1,000 miles of wild west between the herds and the railroad. For that kind of cattle drive, America needs a new kind of hero. The cowboy. After the Civil War, 60% of the South's population lives in rural poverty. In search of work, a new kind of adventurer heads west to cattle towns like Abilene, Wichita, and Dodge City. One farmhand heading to Texas is Teddy Blue Abbott. 23-year-old Teddy Blue is the son of a Nebraska homesteader. My father wanted to tie me down and make a farmer out of me. Never. I ran away from home to become a cowboy. The cowboy mentality, it's a spirit of individuals. I have a communion with the land, with my horse. It symbolizes a resistance to authority. Teddy Blue is one of 35,000 cowboys who will drive cattle to the railroad in Kansas. Standing in their way, a thousand miles of untamed west, unforgiving terrain, and gangs of rustlers. Only a dollar a day, cowboys must be skilled horsemen and cattle wranglers. The lasso dates back to the ancient Egyptians. Mexican ranchers have been using them for centuries and passed their skills on to cowboys north of the border. Cattle brought over by the Spanish in 1493 have bred with settlers' cows from England, creating a new breed, the Texas Longhorn. After centuries roaming the plains, they're wild and easily spooked. Teddy Blue hears what every cowboy dreads. Stampede. cattle drives, Teddy Blue buries three pals. A tough job for tough men. One out of three cowboys is Hispanic or African American. After the Civil War, thousands of freed slaves head to Texas looking for work. One is a 23-year-old from Alabama. Nat Love. It's his first chance to be judged for his skills, not just the color of his skin. The guys on the team are as broad-minded as the plains. It's every creed for himself and every friend for each other to the end. Many of the cowboys, to the surprise of most of us, happen to be African Americans. Black people have the dream of conquering the imagination just like white people do. The West, vast, wild, lawless, with herds worth up to $200,000. Cowboys guard the cattle with their lives and their guns. 
Guns are a way of life in Texas, then and now. Even today, Texans own over 51 million firearms. It's very intrinsic to the American culture and the American identity. We always had a pistol or a rifle. And I think it's part of, don't try to tell me what to do. I'll fight off my enemies on my own. The Cowboys' gun of choice, the Colt 45. Fastest handgun in the West. Six shots without reloading. Colt produces over 30 million guns. The most popular being the iconic 45. In 1873, a Colt 45 cost $17, half a cowboy's monthly salary. Six rounds of bullets, half a day's pay. Frontier men would say Abraham Lincoln may have freed all men, but Sam Colt made them equal. Cowboys drive five million cattle from Texas to the railroad in Kansas, the largest migration of livestock in U.S. history. But one simple invention will soon threaten the cowboy's entire way of life. Barbed wire. In just 20 years, two and a half million new settlers flood into the West. New farms cover half a billion acres of open range. A new battle rages. Cattle rancher versus homesteader. Cowboys like Teddy Blue and farmers are on a collision course. They'd plant a crop next to the trail. When the cattle got into their wheat, they'd come out waving a shotgun and yelling for damages. Boundary disputes are violent, often deadly. One farmer is determined to find a cheap and effective way to keep livestock off his land. Joseph Glidden. When we think about innovation in America, we often think about the big, audacious projects like the Apollo Project. But there's another strain to American innovation, and that's the local inventor, an individual genius with some passion in the middle of the night coming up with that big, transformative idea. In the fall of 1873, Glidden has a breakthrough. Using a coffee grinder, he crudely fashions some steel barbs. His problem, how to secure them. Glidden's solution, bind the barbs between two lengths of wire. His design cuts the price of fencing by 70%. Within 10 years, Glidden sells enough to go around the world 25 times carving the plains into countless ranches and farms and blocking the cattle trails. The open range is closed forever. This single invention made possible the settling of the West much sooner and more efficiently than it would have occurred otherwise. Teddy Blue rides one of the last cattle drives to the railroad. The heyday of the cowboy on the open range lasts only 20 years. But settling the Great Plains will mark the end of one way of life. And the birth of another. 1876. A century of government policies target Native Americans. 371 treaties to keep them separate, isolated, remote. Most of America's 300,000 tribes people now live on government assigned lands, reservations. But resistance is still fierce. I think probably the darkest spot in our history, for me at least, uh, is what happened to the Native Americans. We came here and confiscated their homeland. I think we have a real sense now of what our part was in that. One that I would love to see redefined, rewritten. Across the Great Plains, the federal government acquires millions of acres of the Native Americans' traditional hunting ground to make way for the Iron Horse. The Sioux are forced deep into the Black Hills. As a young boy, 
Black Elk witnesses the coming of the railroad and the destruction of the buffalo herds. Now, age 12, he's about to be part of the Sioux Nation's last triumph. White men come in like a river. They told us that they wanted only a little land. But our people knew better. Gold is covered in the Black Hills. 100,000 prospectors rush in to seek their fortune. The federal government wants to clear the area. On a reconnaissance mission with the 7th Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel George Custer stumbles across the Sioux camp near the Little Bighorn River. Custer makes a fateful decision. With 700 soldiers, Custer charges a camp with 7,000 Native Americans. Within three hours, all the men in Custer's regiment are dead. The Sioux win the battle, but will lose the war. In response, U.S. soldiers force 3,000 Sioux warriors onto reservations. The rest scatter in small bands. Over the next 14 years, the Plains Indians struggle to survive until the incident that finally defeats the great Sioux nation. Wounded knee is a great, great uh, scar on the American uh, landscape. December 29th, 1890. The last band of independent Sioux surrender beside Wounded Knee Creek. As the cavalry disarms them, a gun goes off accidentally. It triggers a massacre. Within minutes, over 200 Sioux warriors, women and children are dead. Now 27, Black Elk survived. When I look back now, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered, as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I see that something else died there. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. The railroad has transformed North America. In just 30 years, 30,000 miles of track cross the continent, more than the rest of the world put together. Thousands of new towns spring up around railroad stations, one every eight miles. Five rail lines link the east and west coasts. The railroad even changes time itself. Until now, Americans set their clocks by the sun. 8,000 different times along 500 rail lines. Scheduling trains becomes impossible. On November 18, 1883, the continental US is reduced to just four time zones. Standard time is born. The railroad is now the largest employer in America. Nearly a million workers. One is a 23-year-old station agent from rural Minnesota. Richard Sears. With the U.S. adjusting to new railroad times, Sears turns entrepreneur and buys a batch of pocket watches. He offers them to other station agents and waits. Bingo. An order comes through, followed by another, and then another. Within six months, Sears sells all his watches, 2,500, earning 10 times his railroad salary. Realizing he can use the railroad for sales and distribution, Sears jumps on the opportunity with an idea that will transform the nation, the mail order catalog. 
I think Americans are naturally entrepreneurial. If you worked hard and if you had good ideas and you were willing to make short-term sacrifices, you could succeed in this country. Next one, this is number one. Ten years after selling his first watch, Sears publishes a 700-page catalog. Now based in Chicago, he processes over 35,000 orders a day, delivering refrigerators, pianos, in one year, over 100,000 sewing machines. Using the railroad, Sears can sell virtually anything anywhere in the country. What really transformed this country wasn't just the westward migration and the development of cities in the east, but the ability to move products across great distances linking together what had previously been very disparate little settlements that had to be largely self-sufficient. By the end of the 19th century, America has 200,000 miles of railroad track, linking the local markets and creating a national economy. Over the next 40 years, the amount of freight carried by rail shoots from 55 to nearly 700 million tons. Resources from the Midwest feed the country's growing industries in the East. The United States overtakes Britain as the largest manufacturer on Earth, soon producing 30% of the world's goods. The railroads laid the basis for the creation of the single largest market in world economy, and this made it possible for the United States to become the global economic power that it did by the end of the 19th century. In 20 years, the U.S. population doubles to 80 million. The number of cities triples. Seven million Americans leave the country for the nation's booming urban centers. Where Buffalo once roamed, now rises the modern world.